club, plus members of the community. I know for the book clubbers, you're all like, what's this microphone doing here? Um, but it's also open to the public, so we're pleased to present two authors, Catherine Arden and Kay Chess. Give them a warm welcome, please. We do have a seat right up front or in the back if you'd like. I'm going to pass around our newsletter. Um, if you'd like to learn about future Bear Pond book events, please sign up. We have a fabulous fall lineup this fall, including Tommy Orange coming to read from his novel, There, There. That'll be October 4th. Uh, next week, we have author Sharon Lamb. She's coming with her memoir, The Not Good Enough Mother. Um, it's a fabulous look at the Vermont opioid crisis as it pertains to family attachment and mothering. Um, so again, welcome. Kim will take over and talk about famous men who never lived. <laughs> Brilliant title. And I'm just going to speak a moment about Catherine Arden's trilogy and The Winter of the Witch. Um, I decided to read all three books, The Bear and the Nightingale, The Girl in the Tower, and The Winter of the Witch, all, straight through. Like, that was like my month of May, I think. Maybe, well, maybe into June. It it, yeah, and plus I read Small Spaces, which oh I had gosh. to bring down from, from upstairs, um, because her sequel to Small Spaces, uh, Dead Voices, comes out next week. This nope. week? Next week. Next week. Yeah. It's, okay. And let me tell you, oh my God. that book is a scary book. And it's for middle grade readers. And I was like in my bed with like the covers <laughs> over my head. I was so scared. My heart was racing. I was like, please don't get off the bus. You know, like, it was it was fabulous. Um, and if you haven't read the whole trilogy, I highly recommend it. I, I kind of have more knowledge of Russian folklore than I probably need, and you mm. you probably do too. Oh yeah. But the writing was just so beautiful and the characters, you know, I just couldn't I couldn't let her go and I needed to to read the whole story. So I hope you have a wonderful discussion. Hope you um, pick up books if you haven't already. We do have them here at the counter and I'll be there doing book selling while everybody's having a discussion. Thank you. I'm gonna stand on top of the speaker so that it feeds back. And you're all probably also the group of, who's usually made the saying, will Kim make you take the microphone? <laughs> no. Um, so I just barely finished Famous Men Who Never Lived, and I can tell you that it's, I really think it's an amazing book. And it's a book for this time, because we are talking about what we're all dealing with right now, which is otherness and feeling like you're where you're supposed to be and dealing with grief. Um, and so if you haven't read it, read it. Um, it's really amazing. So I'm, more, I'm really glad to have both of you guys here. And I have read The Girl uh, and the, the Bear of the Nightingale, but I haven't read the next two yet because I am lame. But um, <laughs> and they're on my shelf to read. So, and I also felt like the characters in this book were, you couldn't leave them, you know? And, I, and at the end of this book, I felt like, Ooh, maybe a little bit more, even though I think that's just we're voracious for characters once we meet them. So I'm excited to have these ladies here. And I also want to know, one of the things we wanted to know was the direction of this conversation tonight. When we meet for Science Fiction Book Club, we usually say, who hasn't finished the book? Do you care about spoilers? Yeah. That's one of the things. So are there people here who don't want to be sort of let in on spoilers? Raise your hand. Okay. And so, one of the questions we were asked tonight and, uh, is, you know, do you want to hear some excerpts from the book? And would there be like, yes? Anybody want to have a little bit of reading? Okay. Okay. And, and this is our opportunity to get their, their autographs, too. Their John Hancock. So I was going to say their Catherine Hancock and their Kay Hancock. Um, yeah, so it's kind of a fun night. So, um, what we will do is we'll try to be judicious about what we say for the ending, but we can still talk about a lot of juicy stuff. And um, we've got the mic so we, partially so, because we're filming, and also so we can keep the air conditioning on. So everyone's like, oh, yeah. Super. So um, I don't know where to stand, because I'm afraid I'm going to make that hiss. But um, well, if you want to pass it to Yeah, yeah. So I'm just like, I'm going to be up here and do whatever is needed. Get comfortable, we're friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I'm just going to sit on this. Just sit on the chair. Sit on the chair. <laughs> in the middle. It's starting to do it already. But um, 
So uh, this is unusual. We've had people come in before, but not too many times. So I'm like, does anyone have a preference for talking about um, either one of you have a preference? Like, I always like to go last. Or I mean, it almost seems like it'd be interesting to discuss like commonalities and like differences in our work because we're both in this like in this giant genre of speculative fiction which is such a broad term that it's like almost meaningless at this point because all fiction is speculative to a certain extent but i think um i think in our books we both ask ourselves like what if you know and then try to fill in the answers in in different ways so I think that's the fun part about having two authors, really, is being able to to compare and contrast, like, even very different kinds of work. Um, maybe I'll just start by saying a few words about what my what my adult books are about and their origins, and then maybe if you want to also, so we just have on the same page, and then um, just we start talking and see how we do. Sounds good. You're moderating like a champ. Oh, it's, it's not my very first rodeo. Um, the best time was in a, was a convention panel, and they had forgotten to give the panel a moderator all together. And so we all just walk up, and there's just us and, and um, an audience, and we're like, oh, gosh. So, so John Scalzi, a very famous fantasy author, um, he rock, he's like, all right, guys, give me the microphone. And he starts to moderate like a champion just without missing a second. And I was, I was very impressed and, and, and wish always to be as cool as John Scalzi <laughs> in that moment in his Hawaiian shirt. Um, anyway, so I'm Catherine Arden. I wrote a trilogy of books called the Winter Night Trilogy. The first one, as we said, is called The Bear and the Nightingale. The second one is called The Girl in the Tower. And the third book, which came out this winter, is called The Winter of the Witch. And they are set in um, what is now Russia in historical Muscovy in the 14th century. Um, so before Russia was Russia, um, right at the end of the um, sort of Mongol overlordship of Russia, and they deal with the independence of Russia. Um, they're a mix of Russian history and Slavic folklore um, and fairy tales. And they follow a, a young girl named Vasilisa who was born with this power to see the the spirits, the um, the creatures of Russian folklore, and able to interact with them, and this power is is good and not good for her in, in many ways, and it kind of pushes her on this like three book long journey. Um, so in short, that is that is the book. Um, I started them in two thousand eleven. Um, I sold the trilogy in late twenty fourteen, and published the first book in twenty seventeen. Um, and yeah, the last book just came out, so it's been quite the odyssey, that trilogy, and it is so nice to be able to talk about them as a whole now, especially since they, they're continuous chronologically and they make one long story, so it's, it's great to be able to feel like it's done, happen, here's a story, um, and we can talk about it tonight, so you wanna... You're really teasing it. It sounds great. Um, oh, yeah. this, am I doing the microphone right? Does this sound all right to all of you? Thanks for coming out. I'm KHS. Uh, I'm just curious, does, is anyone here a writer? A couple people? Yeah. I think I'm hearing Catherine talk about her books. I want to I wanna ask her questions about craft and about how she wrote them. And I'm also sort of interested in questions about publishing. And I'm wondering if, like, what the focus of the book club if it usually ever goes in that direction oh yeah yeah it does all right great good to know i feel like it's always interesting even if like people aren't trying to be published themselves just like what are the nuts and bolts of getting these things yeah i want to know what it's like to be on auto mechanic you know, too sometimes like a, a long so. process so. <laughs> yeah hearing about we how people's jobs work. Car talk. yeah right yeah, yeah. can you all hear me on mic because like it's kind of awkward to pass back and forth nonstop. So if like, if, yeah. if I am audible and for the video, oh, no, it's fine. Fine. Okay. I'll I'll speak up. Is there okay. some place like happy medium we could? It it's won't right. pick up. It yeah, won't pick up. Yeah, I I can just project. Okay. It's fine. Okay. Should I should I keep this and then I feel all right? I feel like I like I'm wearing stilts. Like I I got like <laughs> stilts on and I'm just next to a it's very tall you. person. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be great. All right, I'm I'm gonna try it without.
Yeah, it's a small room. No it's one's that room. far from us. What? No. Oh god. Oh god. <laughs> Sometimes we have people who can't hear. So if you yeah, can't if anyone's hear, anyone's just struggling. tell people to speak up. Okay, uh, loudly. I'm KHS, and my book is called Famous Men Who Never Lived. It's my first, and it's a standalone uh, speculative work that I think would fall under the science fiction category or the alternate history category. Um, but it takes place in our world, but a world in which a large number of refugees from another version of the world have passed into New York City and they're stranded there. So it, the main characters are people who grew up in a world much like ours, but which diverged from our timeline in around 1910. And they have struggled to fit in because even though they're not visually distinguishable from anybody else, <coughs> they don't have the same job skills, they don't have the same memory of the 20th century because the 20th century went completely different in their world. Uh, and they're everyone they've ever loved for the most part, except for the 156,000 of those people who were chosen in a lottery to escape, um, everyone else is dead. So they're dealing with ordinary human grief and also trying to assimilate to a, a com very similar but completely different culture. And uh, the main character is obsessed with the last existing copy of a science fiction book, which from her own world, it doesn't exist in our world. Uh, and so she's trying to find that and getting into trouble as she searches for it. And I think one thing that I think would be interesting to talk about is, is writing about stories and storytelling and why stories are important to us. Mm -hmm. That seems like yeah. something we might have in common. It's interesting because one thing that struck me as I was like reading your book was that it's a book about, in part, like the power of books and the power of memory as like, as like encapsulated in books. Um, and The Bear and the Nightingale, the, the characters aren't literate because it's set in medieval Russia and it wasn't a literate time period. Um, but the, the power of stories is very important to them. And each, each of my books starts with a retelling of a Russian fairy tale, um, which is then echoed in the novel itself. Each book has a fairy tale touchstone that becomes a, a starting point and a, um, a thematic sort of origin for the rest of the longer book. Um, in the same way, you had the book Pyro... The Pyronauts? Py Pyro the Pyronauts, Pyronauts. I write, um, which is kind of the book that gets your character going in, in her world. Um, so I guess why, why books? Why stories? I love them, and I, I, love them I thought other people who read that my book would love yeah. them too, and, and I'm yeah. sure the same is true. That mm. story, even today, when we have other choices of entertainment, fairy tales are really powerful and enduring. And It's true. Yeah. And it kind of embraces, like, the story within a story method as well, right? Um, in the sense that, like, you have a book within the book that is important. And then um, in The Baron Night Gale, you have a fairy tale um, within the larger novel, which is also significant. And the themes in the smaller work are echoed out larger throughout the novel. Yeah. Um, which I think works, like, from a storytelling perspective, because it allows you to, like, sort of distill the themes you want to bring up in a small, like, clean format, and then kind of elaborate on them. It's like a, like a theme song, and then, like, variations a little bit. That's so um, well put. That's interesting. Kind of, right? It's yeah. like how you do in music when you have, like, you know, a four-note, like, run, which is the essence of what you're trying to, like, get across in music, and then you add, like, chords, and you add, like, like different, like, keys, and you just add, like, variations on it, but... Um, you can always bring it back to this like very clean, like small, sort of like er story. Yeah. Which is, um, I don't know, find it interesting. And in your case, it's, it's like a way to get on the same page with the reader mm -hmm. too. Like here's, here's the story that we've all, that we all now know yeah. and the characters in the world know it too. Mm -hmm. uh, I, mean, I think fairy tales in general, they, they're great for a writer because they're always familiar. Like people know fairy tales, like you have these tropes, you have these stories that are repeated over and over again, but you also, they're endlessly malleable as well. Like you can, you can put them in different time periods, you can change the plot, you can change the characters, you can add different faces. So they're both familiar to a reader, like you recognize things that draw you in, but they can also be endlessly strange, which can first like draw you in and then intrigue you or excite you or make you curious. So they're, they're really great, um, I think, vessel for a writer. 
They're old and new. Yeah. Yeah. They're they're just eternal a little bit. These like very basic basic stories. Um, what made you pick the twentieth century? I was thinking about um I guess just about pop culture, high culture and low culture and, and everything in between and how much nostalgia even people of my generation and, and Catherine's, I suspect, were probably mm-hmm. around the same age. Mm-hmm. If people are always taking quizzes online about like which, you know, Saved by the Bell character are you or something like that. A lot as of nostalgia, those like is, cultural nostalgia. For yeah, sure. cultural nostalgia for culture that that hasn't been taken from us. It's not like Saved by the Bell has gone anywhere. We could probably mm-hmm. find it on find streaming it. or yeah. yeah. Um, but I was thinking about if if that was just something that you remembered really well and remembered really fondly but you didn't have access to it every Mm -hmm. copy of it had been destroyed and people on the street didn't know what you meant Mm -hmm. when you said saved by the bell how what a what a strange new importance it would take on i mean especially nowadays talking about immigrants immigration and like people fleeing violence and coming to new cultures like you can be in different part of the world and really shorn of like your cultural context nobody understands your stories your culture at all, and I think it's interesting that you brought that experience, or a version of that experience, to New York, like to America. So it's like being an immigrant in your own country, yeah. which is which is super interesting, and I think really relevant to today as well. New York's a city of immigrants. It's been an entry port mm-hmm. for in- immigrants throughout its long history, mm-hmm. uh, and it's also this. It's a really really old city, so if everything was the same up until 1900, but then you were from a world where things had gone differently a lot of the buildings would still be there. The Manhattan Bridge would probably still be there because it was planned shortly before 1910, so it was already underway, really, like it was built in, I think, 1912. A lot, like the skyline would look mostly the same, but different. And, and if you think how collectively traumatic it's been for us, for instance, the skyline changing when the Twin Towers fell, mm-hmm. just that one difference, it's, it's the same, but it's different. I've felt that way in big cities before, even though I wasn't missing anything, where I felt like, everything seemed sort of familiar but wrong and off Mm -hmm. and that's a powerful and resonant feeling that feeling of being alone when you're surrounded by lots of different people everywhere when people are pressing you in but you still feel like no one really knows you i i think that's something that's that's relatable and i wanted to externalize that metaphor and make it literal and think about what it would be like for a class of people who were invisible immigrants Mm -hmm. in the wrong city like, nobody sees these people and says, like, oh, those folks are definitely from elsewhere. Yeah. You think, like, oh, it's just, like, you know, a normal native New Yorker, but they have this essential, like, inner difference. Which I think speaks to, like, alienation as a concept. It's, like, what makes you um, feel alienated in your own, in your own country. Um, I grew up in Austin, Texas, which is a city that has changed immeasurably in the last, like, 20 years. Um, when I was a kid, in the 90s, Austin was pretty small. It was pretty sleepy. It was it was kooky and a little weird and very chill. And then about 20 years ago, stuff started to happen there. And now Austin is huge and it has a skyline and it has millions of people. No one was born in Austin anymore. Like you go to Austin and it's like, where are you from? Oh, everywhere <laughs> except for actual Texas. And um, it's just, just people came. Ten, hundreds of thousands oh. of people just poured in, yeah. Good place and to it's absolutely transformed the city. Um, and it's it's great. The city is you know thriving, but it's not the Austin that I grew up in in any way. Does this sound familiar to anyone from Vermont? I mean, not to oh, that extent, yeah. but well, some yeah, changes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's, it's, it's um, different. Mm-hmm. Good things and bad things. It was awful stuff. Yeah. So what was your so when you got the idea for your book like what was the process of going from like the the kernel of the idea to building it out to a full story like what was the first thing you thought of was it yeah I'm interested in hearing you ha- answer mm-hmm. that one as well I was thinking about again like that collective memory if every single copy of Tale of Two Cities was just destroyed mm-hmm. like most of us had to read it at some point in high school or middle school. And if I, I, I don't know, like, did, did it, has anyone read Tale of Two Cities at some point in your long life? Yeah. Okay, so like, what's a thing that's in Tale of Two Cities? First line? Yep. Times, yeah. Worst like, that's times. all you have to say. Uh-huh. Yeah, totally. No. Yeah, yeah, what, yeah, what else? Sure. Anybody remember anything else? Uh-huh. 
That's gonna look no, that is kind of <laughs> that's somebody good. different, else. different. Similar. Similar. Yeah. But I there mean, was, yeah. The, I mean, there's the whole bit with the woman. Like, there's the man who had the bad life, the man who was really doing well, successful. In the the two swap. men that look just the same. Yeah, and they swap places. Yeah. There's the guillotine, the guillotine. The tumbrels going through the streets, and the woman that's knitting while people are getting their heads cut off. Is this like sounding? Yeah, yes, like, exactly. I, there, there's the guy who was in prison and he wrote a letter in his own blood, and it's like a really long Dickensian letter, and you're like. Wouldn't you have been about? more concise if it was your own blood? <laughs> um, these are some things that I remember from reading it when I was 15. But I couldn't really tell the story, you know? Like, I can say that and maybe you'd nod and be like, oh yeah, that sounds familiar. Or you'd, maybe you'd remember some stuff better than me, but even if a group of us got together, we probably wouldn't be able to recreate it. It's yeah, like definitely. tantalizingly almost there, but not there. Yeah, I mean, you can't, a book, once it's written, you're not going to write it again. Like, it's a unique, like, moment in time. Like, it's a unique combination What about, like, the million monkeys writing yeah, randomly like, on a million typewriters? Right, for <laughs> infinity, but, like, in, like, reality, like, you know, books are written once, right? Even an author who loses, like, if you lose a week's worth of work on your computer, mm -hmm. like, the work's gone. You're not going to write those words again. You're going to write new words, you know, new sentences, and it's going to be hopefully as good. You'll tell yourself that it's better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like, oh, it's better now. But it's still, like, you know that what you had is gone forever. Like, it's not going to be the same. So, you know, words are permanent and also very, like, ethereal, which is cool. So that was where the kernel of mine came from. Mm -hmm. You know, it was people trying to preserve, like, a group of people who remember this book that didn't exist anymore, trying to preserve it somehow. And then I wrote a short story about it, and it was a very bad short story. And I was in a creative writing program at the time. Mm -hmm. And there were these two guys who hated each other, and, and mm. I wasn't friends with either of them, and they were the only two people who liked it. It was like this kind of like uptight guy who like wore a b little bow tie and had like ankle boots and was like really fancy. And then the other guy that liked the story was like this like stoner <laughs> sci-fi guy. Yeah, that, yeah, that um, like didn't... Those are like MFA like stereotypes. The, yeah, a little and, bit. And these were, two, like... these were two MFA enemies, okay? They Perfect. hated Sweet. each other. Like, Perfect. They're... And this was like the only time they ever, ever agreed on anything was everyone else, including my now wife, was like, throw the story in the garbage, it's horrible. <laughs> uh, but like the stoner guy and the fancy guy were like, this is awesome. You should write a novel. I feel like there's a short story in that. In like, that. Yeah. right? The two, like, MFA rivals who are both, like, MFA archetypes, like, coming together mm -hmm. about a story. I feel, like there, there's a, I feel like there's something in there. Yeah, I only, like, I think if it were fiction, then the story would, would of course, actually be bad. Right, and they'd both be oh. wrong about it. I mean, um, or it either be terrible or a work of, like, unheralded genius. One or the other. I feel like there's no middle. Yeah. You know, like... Well, that's how I created my unheralded genius. Um, yeah. <laughs> how, how, how do you write a trilogy? This is... Those, the first book in your trilogy was your first published book. Yes. Like, have you always had really huge ideas? Did you think it was going to be a long story when you how started you writing start it? How you start writing the story? Even that's an interesting story. Um, well, I didn't... When I started writing The Bear and the Nightingale, I didn't know how much plot you can put into one novel. I really didn't. I was, I was quite inexperienced. And... It turns out you can't put as much plot as you thought you could into a book. Like, more than a couple of big events, and it just becomes overwhelming. It's too much. You've got to have enough time to let your events breathe. I had, I had too much story, I, I discovered quickly, um, as I began to write, for one novel. So I was like, oh, it'll be three. I can make it three. This is fine. Mm -hmm. Again, there was a certain degree of, like, naivete and, like, inexperience involved. I didn't really know how I wanted to start. I just knew that I wanted to write a book based on a Russian fairy tale. And since I was a little bit, I was struggling to figure out how to start it, I, I ended up just writing out the fairy tale I wanted to use in the first chapter. So I took the first chapter to retell my chosen fairy tale, and then as I kept on, I, I began riffing on that fairy tale, which is how um, sort of the first book's plot came together. And I, fin I finished it um, and got under contract with, um, with Random House, but um, there was a bit of a, a wrench in the process at that time because my editor um, wanted me to take the book that I'd written and discard the second half and rewrite the first half and have that be the book. Take the book, but discard the second half and rewrite the book. I mean, in her, in, in her defense, there was a very large like structural flaw in the middle, and the only way to fix it was to either cut one half or the other like it was truly yeah. um a, a, a bad I mean it was my first book like I don't know what to say 
Um, so I was like, all right, it's terrible, but okay. <laughs> so I, um, I, I cut 80,000 words and I put them into a different document and it was sad and it was gone. And I took this like denuded 60K that I had left and began to kind of rework it into what became um, my first book. But then for the second book, I was I was like, okay, new plan. I have this 80,000 words. Wait, so it worked? That there. was the Bear and the Nightingale? Yeah, yeah. You, you fixed it? Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, it worked out. Um, I have this like extra 80,000 yeah. words just on my hard drive. <laughs> That'll be a book too, like shortcut. Because um, I, I had a contract. I had to do it. So I was like, great, shortcut. So I, I pull it out and start working on it. And I worked and I worked. I spent six months on it. I was like trying to make it work. And then within six months, I... I called my editor and I was like, it's never going to work. And she's like, that's why I had you cut it <laughs> in the first place. Um, she's, she's very wise. She knows. And so I was like, it was sad. So I put it away. And I wrote the um, second book, The Girl in the Tower, just from scratch. Just, just, just start it and go. Um, and it's actually, I think, my favorite book in the trilogy. And so I'm really proud of it, actually, because it took, um, it just took a lot of pushing through hard times also like second book syndrome is a thing authors talk about and I think it's real writing your second novel is very hard because your first book you have no expectations no people expecting it to be good um, it's just you and the material and no pressure because like what's the worst that can happen you just don't finish and that's fine um, but with your second book still there's pressure got to finish um you have people hoping you'll finish expecting you to finish like hoping it'll be good too and so you start demanding that each day be a good writing day that each paragraph come off like good the first time and no book is good the first time like no draft is good like it's a process it's like when you're packing up your house to move it always looks worse before it mm -hmm. looks like absolutely. it's packed absolutely absolutely and if someone came by and inspected your packing every day and said like oh it looks like there's a lot of shit on the floor like i don't know you know drafting a book is so messy yeah i think you can speak of this too like i mean even with outlines i'm not an outliner um you just have to put it on the page and keep working at it until it gets gets to where you want it everything comes out of the drawers yeah yeah mm -hmm. it's a mess it's like it's a mess with purpose um so second books are stressful because you're not experienced yet you have no faith in the process but you still have to go through it so i struggled but i finished it the third book by then my story had gone off the rails like i was expecting a book to go this way but it had gone this way and so i had to totally reconceive what I wanted the third book to be um, and I did and it was an exercise and I guess lateral thinking in a certain way and in um, I guess patience also and persistence but I um, I managed to end the story where I intended to end originally but nothing from the first chapter of the first book to the last chapter of the last book has stayed the same except for those two chapters. Wait, so. the last chapter stayed the same? Ish? Conceptually. Wow. So I knew I wanted to start and end, but the three books worth of thing in the middle, <laughs> they went off in a direction that I had no anticipation. That's of wild. To, so. Do you think the end of it, that having that end in sight helped you? No. Because okay. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> for me, I, when I'm writing, I have to be in the moment, in the writing, and try to figure out the logical end. Um, I have trouble writing towards it. Um, I have to let it grow and then find it and then backtrack. Um, some authors, I have friends who do like 200 page outlines before they start and get everything like very dialed and then write. Um, what about you? Do, you? do you outline? You just go? Like, Not like that. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I have a friend who's like, six months of outlining and then like three of writing it's it's wild but i mean weird huh. everyone's got a everyone's That's, got a thing if that works everyone's yeah. got yeah. a thing i outlined on um note cards so i could move them around and mm -hmm. add things mm -hmm. uh but it was the longest thing i'd ever written so i i needed something to keep momentum going yeah. and that way i could be like okay mm -hmm. i'm closing this document and i'm going to the next note card and i'm writing opening up a brand new document mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. about this new thing and i won't look at the bad thing mm -hmm. 
yeah, right. Or worry about that problem later. Were you doing it? Yeah. Cha- were you doing it chapter by chapter? Or were you in Word? Were you in um chapter by chapter? Were you in Scrivener? Or what was your? No, just different like different Google Google documents. Docs. Yeah. Okay. Google Docs. Yeah. Um, I use Scrivener at the very end. If anybody's a writer, it's like a tool that allows you to sort of move whole documents around in a spatial sort of way. Is that it? Yeah, I'm not I have some it friends well. who use it. Like it is, it's a novel writing or a book writing app. Um, so it helps you manage long chunks of text, I think, more easily than, say, Word does. Um, you have to convert your document out of it back to Word in order to get it to your publisher, who will only ever use Word ever, ever <laughs> in history. Um, but until then, like, authors have sort of a wide variety of ways to write their books. I think it's just very individual. Um, I use Word. It's just easy. I grew up with it. Like, it's not a pain. Um, I use like find and search to find where I'm in document. Yeah. Um, yeah. For me, it was like to reduce the temptation to look at my own, like to navel gaze and like look at the first sentence again and be like, maybe I could just find yeah. a synonym for that word and, mm-hmm. you know. Keeping, that was keeping going is so important. Yeah. I feel like that's the key is like not stopping. Do you have any tips for that? For not stopping? Um, I have a word count goal every day. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's important just to like, meet your word count goal so mm-hmm. you keep moving forward um otherwise it's so tempting just to, like rewrite mm-hmm. um and the problem is you can't really fix the beginning until you know the end um i have a friend who says the butt has to match the face <laughs> <laughs> and you don't know if that can happen until you've written the face and the butt and mm-hmm. so you gotta write to the end and then make them match but like you have to have the whole thing first Whatever works for you conceptually, <laughs> yeah. like it's just, it's just, you know, different stories, different folks, right? So How are we doing, Kim? You're doing great. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I was mm-hmm. gonna say one of the one of the things that I found helpful in writing was uh, joining a, a group of other writers. Who oh yeah, write, beta. And then mm-hmm. um, you know, there was a, an online group called um, Other Worlds of Wonder Writing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> One woman um, facilitates it from Hawaii, and the other one lives in in Australia. Holy time it's zones! On, it's completely online. <laughs> All right. But um, you, we would do what's called book in a week challenges, mm-hmm. and everybody would choose their number uh, of pages to write, and and you would post it. And so then you had people saying, "You can do," you know, ten thousand yeah. words. You can do. Yeah. Just yeah. getting text yeah. out is such a is such the name of the game, especially yeah. in the early stages. And saying I'm not allowed to edit. Just uh-huh. keep writing. Just keep. What about your editorial process? Did you have like a ton of rewriting to do once you drafted? I um, my agent didn't want me to do very much at all, but mm-hmm. then with my editor, I did have some stuff. But it was like it was really interesting. He looked at it in a way that I wasn't able to look at it, and I wish I could learn from this and apply mm-hmm. it to other things. Mm-hmm. But I feel like there were like multiple story arcs happening simultaneously in time in the book, mm-hmm. and he figured out that like one character needed to have a revelation earlier and one needed to have one later. So, like, all the events are the same, but they needed to be stretched in different ways. Interesting. Yeah. I feel like editors, I mean, they can always see things you can't because they're further away from your material. Mm -hmm. You know, they just have perspective because they haven't spent hundreds of hours (laughs) looking looking at at it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and they're less precious than you. Like, I've definitely been in a place where I'm like, I love this paragraph. It's a Mm -hmm. beautiful paragraph. (laughs) It expresses this delicate human emotion, like blah blah blah. My editor's like, "This is, this is terrible. Take it out." And I'm like, <laughs> you know, so Still your yeah, yeah. So I think, oh, editors can be like clearer eyed than authors yeah. for sure. Yeah. Well, reading as a mm-hmm. reader is different from reading as a, an editor. Like, they're they're. The paragraph might be great, but maybe it's just not working. Actually, maybe the yeah. paragraph is beautiful. Maybe mm-hmm. they don't think it's beautiful, but maybe the paragraph is beautiful. But it's just exists in a chapter that is too slow and is clogging up the works or something like that. I feel like it's funny. Whenever I get feedback, whenever someone says, this wasn't working, I always believe them. Mm Because readers know. Mm -hmm. But when they tell me how to fix it, I never believe them. Mm -hmm. Because (laughs) their fix is always wrong. Like, the identification is right, but their fix is like, nope, wrong fix. Mm -hmm. But you are right, the the problem is there. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's my my kind of, like, go-to mindset is, like, I believe you if there's a problem, but like I'm not gonna put a monkey in this like one scene yeah. to like add this one thing. No, you yeah. know. Like, and a good editor won't tell you exactly how to do something either. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, know. mine will, like, make suggestions, and they're sometimes good, sometimes, like, not what I want, but, like, it's nice because I think she tries to, especially early on, she tried to not just give me tons and tons of work, like, fix these 18 things without making me feel like she had thoughts to help out with those fixes, you know? Like, because each big fix is, like, you know, dozens of hours of you, like, just like, squinting and sweating and swearing at your computer. You know, once a book's written, making a major plot shift or, like, a major character shift is hard. Because it's like dominoes. Like, one thing goes, and, and there's 18 more things that go, too. So it's, like, this very delicate kind of, like, process um, fixing a book. Because by, like, cutting out a whole half of a book and rewriting the first half was, like, sort of an editing baptism by fire a little bit it was did you start to get a sense of what readers wanted when your books were being published i mean yes you definitely and was it too late anyway were they all done anyway. but like i feel like and i'm sorry i feel like you can't write for readers really because there's so many readers and then they'll have yeah, different things guys, yeah like, right the opposite. like some folks will be like i love character x some folks are like, I hate character <laughs> You know, some folks are like, this is my favorite part, this beautiful thing. And the next person's like, that part was my least favorite part. It was terrible. You know, so that is our group right there. Right? Yeah, you can't, you can't please everyone. All you can do is please yourself, I think is really just, you know, otherwise it'll go insane. It'll go absolutely insane, you know, trying to please everyone. You know. So, speaking of, of the group yeah. Do you, and do you want to hear a little bit from each of the You can also books? take questions yeah. too if questions. y'all have yeah. them. Questions? Yeah. Um, this, I thought this was wonderful. <laughs> How beautiful. Fire and hot time, you know. It, Wait, it, is it, it actually it's real? Underneath. On the inside, I, you know, I. I look at oh, that's such a cool thing. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so that's, that's amazing. I had a Kindle edition. I didn't. Yeah, yeah, that's super cool. Yeah, my cover designer thought of that. I know, right? Kindle editions yeah. don't get all credit goes to him. Jacob Bala, he's really smart. Good idea. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's that's the book within the book that she discussed. Yeah, that's oh, the book that does cool. that. So the, the outside of the book looks like it's the Pyronauts. Which underneath the jacket. Underneath the jacket. Underneath the jacket. Oh, yeah. the so cool. The inside of the outside. Such a cool concept. There, there's two kinds of people in the world. There are people who take the jackets off right away and see it before they even, <laughs> even read the book. And then there's people who never are ever going to take, take the jacket off. Yeah, I've read Tatcha. But what are you going to use as a bookmark to take the jacket off? Exactly. Poor librarians. They put them in and they seal them. I know. They do so much work. <laughs> Um, so maybe you kind of already gave it away with your reference to uh, Charles Dickens and Tale of Two Cities, but is, is there a specific author of her book that you kind of had in mind that you thought was pivotal in the way that kind of the, the Ezra Slight book was in terms of if it wasn't there, then you know so many cascading effects would... I think that's a trick question because <laughs> the characters in the book, or some of them anyway, the characters in famous men who never lived are obsessed with finding the Pyronauts because it's so quote-unquote important, but I don't think it actually is. Right. It's important to, to the protagonist, Helen, because it represents something to her. And it says, even though it's a work of speculative fiction, it says more about the real world that she comes from, about her home, than it really says about the made-up world within its pages. But I don't think it actually like changed the course of history the way that, that she may think that it does. Um, but I had fun doing a kind of like mid-century sci-fi pastiche in the sections from the Pyronauts that I included. I really enjoy reading books that have sections of other books in them, like The Princess Bride, almost the whole thing is the S. Morgenstern Princess Bride, mm -hmm. right? Um, Misery by Stephen King, like I love the, the Misery sections, I wish those were real books, I wish there was a whole <laughs> series about mis Misery Chastain, even though the character is so disparaging, I would love to read that. Um, so that was, it was fun for me to write in a different voice, and I was thinking, I kept thinking about, it doesn't have a similar plot, really, or even a similar style, but I kept thinking about um, the Heinlein book, A Door Into Summer. Mm -hmm. was, my uncle's here tonight, I was just telling him, my grandmother had the paperback of it at her house, uh, and it's like, they go forward into the future to 1999, mm -hmm. um, and... I, I really enjoyed reading that as a teenager, and I was thinking about that. Do they have um, 
the uh, flying machine, the, uh, the, the, the suits, the uh, oh. Kevlar suits, but everybody wore Kevlar suits. Yeah. <laughs> I the think they had, they had uh, robot servants for sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. We do too. They're called Roomba. <laughs> <laughs> With the alternate history sections, how did you balance trying uh, input dumping versus sort of keeping what was just strictly necessary? Because I, I know with, with yours, I, I could have read quite a, quite a bit more of, of this alternate world. It's like, um, but there's obviously story constraints, and you don't, you don't want to just linger too much there. So, how, what was your balance in that? Yeah, um, I think that you want the reader to want more. So if I have to err on one side or the other, I'm glad to have done it that way. But so people, characters, the whole book takes place in our world, but characters are reminiscing about their own world and thinking about how the 20th century went and thinking about the you know brands of oatmeal that you could buy at the store that don't exist here and stuff like that. Um, so I think that's what you're talking about when you're saying like they, they, they're thinking about um, world, geopolitical events that happen that, that are, and the names of countries that are different from the nations that we have. Mm -hmm. um, and because I think it's kind of a, a cheat actually to be writing a book that takes place in our world because instead of being introducing the reader constantly by the, the because the setting is that other world, like you have to do a lot of info dumping, you have to do a lot of world building right away so that readers don't feel alienated, but they also don't feel overwhelmed by small details that aren't plot or character. Um, by having it all at a remove where the characters are in a familiar world, but they're thinking about this world, it made it easier for me to limit what I um, like to keep it, to keep from doing the info dump thing, I think. Great. Just a little bit of a twist on something was interesting to us mm -hmm. as we read it, like, oh. I felt like a little of it went a long way, and I didn't want to be self-indulgent because those were the most parts, the most fun parts of the book to write. But it's like if you're if you just rewrote Russian fairy tales for the whole book, there would be no momentum. There'd be nothing happen, mm -hmm. nothing that you invented happening. It would just be, um, It'd be a different kind of book. It'd be a book of fairy tales, which is yeah. certainly a, like another artistic endeavor. But yeah, it's, it's not about a novel, form, you know, but it's like different. It's like. You know, it's like apples and oranges a bit, and with novels, of course, you want them to go somewhere. That is the point. I but I think, trying. you know, I, I write because it's fun for me, but it's not always, like, fun every minute, and some things are more fun to write than others, and I think even it, a lot of us in our jobs or in the craft that we practice, it's like, well, I have to eat my broccoli, and then I can have, you know, my frozen Snickers bar or something like that. <laughs> like, there are bits where you know you need to get a character to a particular place, but it's not going to be that much fun for you, or you don't have an idea at first for how you'll approach it. And then there are parts where you're almost playing, and um, those parts are to be treasured, though you can't do them all the time. Yeah. I'll definitely like fill in, like, oh, a cool thing happens here, keep going. Like, <laughs> I've definitely filled in, like, witty remark here, but like, I don't know what it is, but I just, I just keep going, like, this is clearly funny here, keep going, like, you know, so if you don't have, like, an inspired thought for a certain section, I'll just skip it and, like, continue on, because often, like, you can backtrack and have a good idea later, but if I'm, like, must be clever, must be clever, must be clever, it won't, it won't work, it just, just won't come, nothing, I'll think, like, you know, cat, dog, tree, boy hop hop like like the, the words won't come properly so I think it's important just to like like you said play and just like keep moving and not put a ton of pressure on yourself for any given paragraph day scene character just kind of come know. back on a funny day yeah come back when you're feeling funny right um or get a funny friend to like suggest a joke I don't know <laughs> what would you say here um any other questions yeah did you have to oh sorry did you have to um read Russian uh, fairy tales I was a Russian. Point in your life. So I spent you, two years in Moscow um, yeah. as a as a student, and I was a Russian major at Middlebury College. So I had kind of a background in the subject before I before I embarked, um, which was very helpful. Do you have any Russian roots? No, I don't. Um, my family is Irish and German for the most part, but I, I spent two years in Moscow, and I, I um, studied quite a bit of Russian, and so I had sort of a spiritual like love of the subject, a lot of respect for it, um, for sure. How did you pick that era of Russian history? 
Um, I feel like when writing about Russia in the West, we have a lot of cliches about it. Like there's a kind of almost a visual shorthand for Russia. There's like snow and onion domes and like troikas and czars and jewels and Ale and freaking Anastasia. Um, Anastasia. I, uh, yeah. Other topic. We won't go there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, but but I wanted to write about a time period that didn't have those cliches, those shorthand visuals, because I wanted to approach Russia from sort of a fresh perspective that would be free of baggage for um, a Western reader. I was like, well, before stars, before onion domes, before all these things happened, there was Russia in the 14th century, um, when it was just becoming a nation instead of a collection of cities. Um, and the, the event that kind of culminates my series is an event that um, arguably first created Russia as it is now. Um, so I wanted to kind of speak to the creation of Russia in my books um, and also have a book that embraced like Russian folklore, um, Russian like spiritualism, paganism, um, orthodoxy without a lot of like sort of again baggage. So that's why something's behind I you. I see you in the purple. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so can you speak a little bit about your research um, to that effect of like that historical period? Like, did you have to do all the research first and then all the books could kind of like fit into what you already knew? Or did you like, did you find as you were writing, you had to go back and like, wait, I don't know as much about this or I actually need to research this thing instead? Yeah, like, so research and writing is an interesting like pairing. For me, I like to write and research because I feel like the research informs the writing, but the writing informs the research too. So I'll be like, oh, interesting fact, I want to work that in and keep writing and then be like, oh, I need to know more about this. Go back to the research, find a new fact, go back to writing, and they, they nourish each other. Um, I think a danger of only researching is you can research forever. There is always a new thing to learn. You'll never be a full like, and complete expert in a given subject. I will say medieval Russia has very few primary sources. Um, and so, my reading was largely in secondary sources and in primary sources from like a hundred years later as well. And so I had to get to a place where I knew all I could and then guess. Because like exactly how people lived in the 1350s, you can kind of guess because you know about like the, the 1450s, um, but never a hundred percent. But it's fun for a fantasy author because you can fill in like, oh, I think I know why something happens. Um, like, for example, the final kind of battle in the final book happened in history. It's a real battle. And everything in the book goes down the way history has it. Mm -hmm. However, the reasons for things occurring, which are unknown in history, were filled in in my books by my plot, by me. Like, I, I added reasons that, I mean, could have been, we don't know. <laughs> Um, but it was fun to take real historical bones and kind of add backstory to the bones. And that was a fun way to combine history and a fantasy. Let's have one more hand. Yeah? I was kind of curious back to the, like, how much do you include not having much mm -hmm. exposure to uh, Slavic folklore? I loved having the characters, the Domovo and Rosalka, and mm -hmm. these different ones kind of crop up periodically throughout the books. Yeah. I, I assume there's more of them that exist, so there are many. how do you choose when to have them and how many to have? I mean, it was more like what the story needed. I think I was trying to tell a certain story and I would pull in characters that had personalities or skill sets the plot required, um, or just ones I thought were extra cool. It was a very, writing's a very like fluid process. You kind of do what you feel is right in the moment and keep going. and often rewrite it many times so um, one reason I wanted to write about medieval Russia is that in Russian folklore you have this vast variety of spirits you have household spirits for every building on your farms mm -hmm. there's like a house a house spirit and the house spirit has a wife and then you have a bathhouse spirit and a threshing house spirit cowshed spirit stable spirit dooryard spirit like there's one for everything and their personalities kind of match their building like the um, bathhouse is often a little rickety, dangerous shack on the edge of town. It would burn down often because, you know, fire in the bathhouse. So the bathhouse spirit, the bunny, is kind of malicious. 
um, he'll like scald you. Mm-hmm. He'll light fires. He's kind of lascivious. He like spies on girls. Mm-hmm. Like he's, um, but he can also like tell the future. Mm-hmm. So um, I didn't invent any spirits of any kind. They're all in Russian folklore. So um, I mean, I give them personalities sometimes, but um, there are no sort of invented folklore characters or or folk tales in the book. They're all actually from. Uh, question for you, actually. Um, you have a book that straddles genres. So when you were creating it, did you feel any sort of pressure to like push it towards one or the other, or you know, find a home for it? It's the first book thing. You can do it. At, no one's going to read it anyway, right? right. Like, except for the two guys, right? Um, so, uh, yeah. No, I'm I'm from a. Um, a literary fiction background more than a science fiction background, but I've always enjoyed reading sci-fi and watching sci-fi TV. Um, but I didn't feel like I, I wrote. I started writing this book while I was in an MFA program where everyone was like, "Oh, this is trash," you know. Right, right. Uh, Man, MFAs. That sounds kind of brutal. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're mean. It's weird. That's so yeah. mean. Um, but <laughs> oh, I yeah. felt like so in a way I, I wanted to really be conscious of the history of speculative fiction and not feel like I was like doing something for the first time just because I don't know about it um, but I was really just I think the like the the beauty to me of speculative fiction is I think this is related to what you're saying about mm-hmm. filling in gaps in the historical yeah. record with events that either you make up mm-hmm. or that are fantastical that you know mm-hmm. that are without beyond the realm of reality right like I think speculative fiction allows you to take what we know about people and change one big detail and then see how how, like, how things would react out from that yeah I'm thinking of the Underground Railroad by Colson Whitehead mm-hmm. I feel yeah. like it's a huge right. example of like just a switch in history illuminating history um, yeah I mean that's, that's alternate history like right uh, everyone's read that book or heard of that book mm-hmm. about what if the Nazis had won World War II or something like that um, yeah. But beyond alternate history, I think other genres of of sci-fi and fantasy too. Like, what if there were two cultures that had a conflict and they had a sort of colonialist relationship, but it wasn't a race thing. It was about one being one kind of alien and that breathes water, and one being this other kind of alien that doesn't breathe water or something. You know, like it's we can see problems that exist in our real world in a different way when we're viewing them through a a context of fantasy or science fiction Mm -hmm. and it frees writers I think to explore and it frees readers to be maybe more open-minded or see things from a different direction Ah. it's like a new perspective on your own own reality I guess are there any more questions Mm -hmm. um as a first-time novelist you you can't sell a project on spec so without having written it first Mm -hmm. Um, you can sometimes, like I did, sell a series on the strength of one book, but they're not going to just like take your concept or your treatment and say, oh great, write that. That's not a thing. As you move like on career-wise, that can be a thing. You can say, I have this idea, and they're like, great, do that. Colson Whitehead's like, hey guys. Yeah, he's like, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, or like, or like Stephen King, he's like, so grocery list, and they're like, sure, please, Stephen, Here, here's money, Stephen. Um, yeah, for sure, but that's, that's like, a, that's a future career thing, right? So, um, so I, I knew I wanted a trilogy, and um, my agent said, like, this is gonna be a trilogy, and they were like, okay, three books, so, um, when we sold the books in the UK, they bought two, they bought the first two, and then bought the third one separately. Which can be a thing to like limit exposure for a publishing house. If the first two books tank, they don't want the third one. You know, they it's just the cold hard reality of And a there'll series. be some like fringe people in the UK, uh-huh. like how does it end? Yeah, right. And it's brutal, <laughs> but like um, cause series can be great because the first book can support the other ones, you know, because like readers want to continue, but also you know that it is very unlikely that the the subsequent books will do better than the first book because it's like diminishing returns right you're gonna have like x readers read the first book and then maybe hopefully 80 percent go on and then 60 percent go on so it's always like a, a diminishing game um for trilogies yeah, um, my book has interview transcripts. They're fake transcripts with um, different individuals who are part of this group of people that traveled through this sci-fi gateway, and it it was just those were also really fun to write. It was fun to write in different voices and to 
talk about things that the main characters don't know about. Um, but I was also, I was influenced by a job I used to have in 2008 when I lived in New York City and worked for the city of New York as an investigator of allegations of police misconduct. It's a really um, cool job. Yeah, it was crazy. It's I was wild. like 21 years old, you know, like oh my God. And trying to look older and speak with a very deep voice because <laughs> I'm talking oh my God, to a that's, police officer. That's so intense. Um, yeah, oh, it was man. weird. But I, I, one thing I did a lot was I transcribed interviews that I had conducted. So I would have a conversation with somebody and it would be on a Maxell cassette tape and then I would listen to it and like try to write down everything that they'd said and like rewind and listen to it again. Mm -hmm. And I just really, I love dialogue as a writer and I love the way that people speak. Mm -hmm. And I also, like you get so many different versions of a story. In the case of these investigations, mm -hmm. yeah. it would be like five people who had all seen this traffic stop and they all had a different version of like mm -hmm. what the officers looked like, who'd spoken first, whether the officer had hit the person in the car or not, you know. Mm -hmm. And so there's like a different take on the facts and there's also just a different way of, of telling, of pre like speaking. Like how do you present your mm -hmm. story? Yeah, yeah that's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I wanted mm -hmm. to, I wanted to play with that a little and I also wanted to, one thing that I value about New York is the different kinds of people that live there and I wanted to, though I am a white woman, I wanted to write about um, other kinds of folks and show that New York isn't like Seinfeld or girls or something like that, that there are other people who live there, old people and young people and people of color and immigrants from different cultures and queer people. And so I, I wanted to go beyond the two characters I chose as point of view characters and have the opportunity to um, to use those interview transcripts. And then I think it added some levity too. It's like, this is like this depressing book about, um, you know, people who are grieving. And so it's, it's fun to have a section that I can read out loud that stands alone. That's about someone lying to her neighbors and telling them she drinks her own menstrual blood. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> oh man. So, Would you ever write a full on yeah. epistolary novel? Like just, just go full like letters, interviews, emails and like, and like, I love reading out. those. Aren't they yeah, fun? They're like, really they're fun. They're super fun. I, I'm a little intimidated. Like, I'm like, that I feel would like be, be really hard. hard. Yeah. Especially in, like, super emotional moments. It's always secondhand, or it has to be. Um, but when it's done well, it's, like, so dazzling, too. So it's, like, that's a really hard, like, structure for a book. I yeah. I know you, you're all a, a sci-fi group here, but mm -hmm. has anybody read An American Marriage by Tayari Jones? she's got a character who's in prison for almost a decade mm -hmm. and they write letters back and forth and it's a way of getting like for one it's a way of avoiding the research of what it's like to be in a men's prison which i'm guessing the author never has been in and it's a way of cutting out the boring parts mm -hmm. because being in prison is a lot of routine and tedium mm -hmm. it's a way of like cutting out some brutality that isn't what she wants the book to focus on and then she can show how the character's relationship with each other changes because the way like they start out with like dear so and so your loving wife so and so and then by the end it's just like initials and shit you know you can yeah, tell when they're mad at each other see, just yeah, by yeah. seeing how they write the yeah. letter yeah, yeah cool. I think there's a lot of tricks you can do is what I'm, oh, what yeah. I'm getting at yeah. like, I'm thinking of Dangerous Liaisons too which is kind of the sort of the original epistolary novel is that epistolary? yeah yeah, yeah the yeah. whole thing I only um, I'm sad to say know that from Cruel Intentions yeah the actual yeah. the novel is really worth it it's, it's, it's a totally epistolary novel and um, manages to like find the emotion even though it's all people's letters which is really great and oh yeah original dracula is a pistol too it's like i think it was yeah many ways to write a book which is the great thing about it it's a very flexible art form i feel like we've been an hour like it might be a little late for for reading unless people are super super mega keen on a short reading um, <laughs> thank you dan <laughs> If you want to read something, go ahead. Um, so, I'm do people want chill. to have a chance to maybe get books Yeah, we can sign books. Or or purchase books. Mm -hmm. Have some more questions. Chill. Eat some M&Ms. Eat some M&Ms. Oh, yeah, there's yeah. snacks, snacks yonder. Snacks. All this stuff. Cool. Let's just do that. Signatures. Awesome. Yes. Signatures. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.